Vote for one hand and have Coach Soul. I have an ex on the National Football League. <laughs> but now he's going to talk about the fundamentals of run, blocking, and pass blocking. Everybody has their own little different thing. You've heard, you've heard the uh, uh, keep rolling, talk a little something about the fundamentals of pass protection. Okay, now uh, you're going to hear somebody. Howard's going to talk a little bit about something. Now, Michael, uh, this is you know Jacksonville went you know one game away from going to the Super Bowl. They do some nice things down there. Okay, he's going to be all fundamental stuff that he's going to talk about here. Now, his drill tape. Okay, his drill tape that you're going to see, okay, is available here. See John. All of you get it from John. See John. Okay, so this is Mike Major, the Jacksonville Jaguars. He's got the two biggest tackles in America. Thank you. special situation here because uh, it's something that uh, Jimmy started way back when over at Spain Field with about eight or nine guys and, and then mushroomed to the point where we just got, uh, he had to hire out ballrooms and we had to have security guys and we got demonstrators and all this other kind of stuff. And it's just a great opportunity for line coaches and other coaches from uh, other positions to get together and, 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 and talk about the concepts that, that we feel are important. One of the things that uh, I've always been concerned with is the idea that the offensive line, in my mind, basically a lot of people feel this way, the offensive line is sometimes, that's cool. the offensive line in some, in some situations is thought of as, uh, you know, the forgotten children or the children of the storm or, you know, the whole deal, it's a deal that you talk about. And uh, basically what you have to understand is the fact that you're coaching a bunch of guys that nobody else wants. Uh, you know, they're not, they're not good enough to be defensive linemen, and they're not, of course, athletic enough to be skilled people. So we end up with them. And the thing that we try to do, or that I try to do with them, is to make them understand that they're not a necessary evil. And you as a coach basically have to preach that to them all the time. The offensive line, you know, big fat guys, okay, you guys, all you guys over there, and you know, all the good guys are over here. And it's a constant process where you're dealing with the mental uh, aspect of these people, where they are, you know, the cogs in the wheel, or, you know, uh, the engine that runs the boat, or, you know, the, the, wind, uh, the wind beneath the wings. It's the same deal. You're talking about people who nobody ever watches, right? <laughs> nobody ever watches the offensive line, because they may be the offensive line coach. I know I used to tell my guys in Boston College, hey, there's only two people that are watching. There's me and your mom. And all your mom's waiting for you to do is just to get up. All right, she's making sure that you're not hurt. Dad, your dad never watches you. I know when I was a player in college, I used to ask him, hey, geez, how, how do you think I played after a game? Oh, you did, you did, oh, you did good, you did good. I found out from talking to, talking to my mother that all he ever did was watch the ball. He never watched me. So as an offensive lineman, you're constantly dealing with the fact that you're basically behind the line. You're, you're, you're behind the scenes. You're a hidden person. And so as far as our job as line coaches is to constantly deliver the message to these guys that they are a very, very necessary and very, very important part of what this game is all about. Because they couldn't run the ball or they couldn't throw the ball without us. And tell them all the time that they are the most important aspect of the football team. One of the things I'd like to deal with uh, before I get started in any uh, drill work or any fundamental aspects is just to give you a little bit of my philosophy on how I think uh, things are as far as offensive line uh, is concerned. And and again, it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a philosophical thing pointing toward the direction of the importance of the position. One of the things that you're dealing with with offensive linemen is the fact that you want guys that are tough. Okay? They have to be tough people. They can't be guys that are finesse guys. You gotta preach that to them. Tough, nasty. Alright? Like Tun Chilton was talking about. About being aggressive. About being a nasty person. I don't know how many times in my coaching career I've used the word nasty to offensive linemen. And want them to take that to heart. They must become nasty players. Because this is 
something, what we're doing is a nasty business. Right? You don't teach people normally to walk down the street and hit other people. Okay? And what you're doing is the idea. Whereas if you're a receiver, you're catching the ball, you're running back, you're running. Okay? Quarterback, you're throwing. Hey, as, a, as an offensive lineman, believe me, you're hitting people. You're striking other people. And sometimes I'll sit back and I wonder, you know, I'm making my living teaching other people to hit other people. All right? And sometimes it's a strange type of situation, a strange thought enters my head in that respect. But realistically, what you're dealing with here is the idea of toughness. Okay? Not pretty guys. You can have all kinds of 300 pounders, 6 foot 8 guys, you know, so on and so forth. Just like in the, in the, in the Dirty Dozen movie where the general is standing there and he's pointing the troops out to Lee Marvin and they're all running around, they're all shining, all this kind of stuff. And Lee Marvin looks at the general and he says, yeah, but can they fight? And that's, that's, a, that's a factor right there. That's a fact. You gotta be tough. You gotta be fundamentally sound. You gotta believe in fundamentals. Fundamentals are, are a habit. Fundamentals are something that you're constantly striving to improve. It's your craft. You're like a carpenter or a woodworker. You're constantly dealing with your craft aspect. Each individual's got to know what's expected of him and how to master the requirements of his job. And constantly dealing with the mental aspect of it. Blocking can be developed to a greater degree than any phase of football because it's a most unnatural task. Like I said before, you don't walk down the street and strike other people. Okay? That's not something that you normally do. And you're not allowed to do that or you'd be arrested. Right? Requires patience, many hours of hard work. Right? As an offensive lineman, believe me, that's one of the things you're going to do. Jack Bignell, a guy that I worked for for years, said, hey, if I was going to start a business tomorrow, I'd hire all offensive linemen to work for me. Because they work all day and they work for practically nothing. And they're very happy doing it. And it's a constant process where hard work and dedication, determination, and all types of things that go along with it are part of the framework of being an offensive lineman. The more techniques you can master, the easier it is to cope with the various situations you'll be faced with. And it's our job as coaches to try to create these abilities or create these situations so these guys can develop these techniques. Repetition must be accepted as a way of life. You're going to do these drills over and over and over again. Okay? One of the things that we have to do is try to vary the drills or try to give them a little bit of, of, of variety so they cannot get bored at what they're doing. All right, success can only be brought about by tremendous confidence in one's ability. You've got to develop confidence. You've got to develop a mental framework. You've got to develop the aspect that what, what you're doing is right. And what you're doing as a coach is creating that ability to become a good, a good football player. Concentration, self-discipline, communication, willingness to pay the price are all part of being a respected offensive lineman. And it's all part of the mental aspect. Again, we are, you know, not, not give me your tired to report, not the last stop before the bus stop. Now, this is an important group. Determined, intelligent, aggressive blocking are indispensable qualities of a great football team. Believe me, like I said, you couldn't play the game without us. From both a technical and a psychological standpoint, it's difficult for a team to have outstanding morale, confidence, and enthusiasm when it lacks the ability to sustain a great ground game or provide adequate protection for the passer. Great football teams will rally around the offensive line. Whenever a football team is playing well, whenever they're winning, whenever they're successful, everybody points to that group up front, those five guys. And they always say, boy, our offensive line is really playing well. All right, you got a great offensive line. They're really doing a hell of a job. Yeah, and that's all part of it. Believe me, without those guys, you can't win those football games that you're faced with week in and week out. From the standpoint of blocking fundamentals, we want to develop a tough, aggressive, and intelligent blocking aspect. Right? Tough, aggressive. Those are words that you're constantly using. Not a finesse, not a finesse team. We want our people, our enemies, to be hit. Right? We're not gonna, we're not gonna, pro, we're not gonna push anybody. We want to hit people. We're not. Now again, I don't want to confuse this with the idea of finesse blocking or influence kind of concepts. But again, we're, we're, we're talking about hitting people, coming off the football. We want to work fundamentally on the blocks, which you want to reduce the habits, never sacrifice the ball. You're constantly coming off the ball. You want to create as much momentum as you possibly can. You've got to have individual pride to be the best blocker in football. You're constantly striving to be the best player that you can be. Self-actualization is something that you're dealing with here. 
the ability to reach one's potential. Now, very seldom if ever happens, you're constantly dealing with the idea where you want to push that envelope, make that kid believe that he can become better than he is all the time. You gotta have pride in the team and the unit and in yourself. Team first, unit, most of all, unit is very important, unit pride. Having pride in that unit, developing that aspect of those players. Right? And then of course, pride in yourself, pride in your ability, pride in your technique. Strive to make a contribution to become the best line in professional football. This comes right out of our playbook now. This is something that they see every year when we open up the playbook. We'll go through this section and talk through it. Some of them have been through it for you know a couple of years. Some of it's brand new to them. Right? But it's just a constant process where I'm trying to develop the mental aspect of it. You must know the complete play in order to end up in the proper follow-through position. Finish each job given. That's why it's called an assignment. It's called an assignment for you. Nobody has a playoff. No offensive lineman ever has a playoff. It doesn't say under you, backside guard, take a playoff. Everybody has a job. You've got to finish that job. Blocking is a matter of pride, desire, refuse to be whipped by the defensive man. The upper hand can be gained by mentally intimidating the defender. Constantly staying after that guy, finishing him off. I'm not talking about you know, jawing with him or trash talking him, but mentally intimidating him. By springing to the line of scrimmage, you can't wait for the ball to be snapped next time so you can knock shit out of that guy. Effective line play begins in the huddle. It's a conceptual game. The quarterback calls the play. You think about what's the play? What's the diagram in your head? Where do I fit into the puzzle? What's my piece of the puzzle? All right? And then the defense lines up. They give you the stimulus. What's your response? How are you? How, how do you prepare to run this play? How have you prepared in practice to do the things that you're asked to do? It's a mental game. It's a mental game. Somebody sent this uh, to me one time, and, I, and, and after he said it, I, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. This game is played from the ears up. And basically, it is. It's a mental game. You have to be mental in this type of a situation. You've got to come off the ball on time. You can't be slow getting off the ball. You've got to do all these types of things together, and then do your job so everybody's working together. Everybody is aggressive, and there's no uncertainty involved. No hesitation. You don't want to hesitate at the line of scrimmage. When I was a college player, our coach had a rule. Hey, when in doubt, fire out. All right? You don't know who to get, go pick one out and go 100 miles an hour. Make a mistake at 100 miles an hour. He didn't give a rat's ass if you made a mistake then. But you had to come off the ball aggressively. You did not hold back in that kind of situation. I always know we're running practice. I'm standing behind the offensive line. I always know the guy that's going to make the mistake. He's the guy whose head is going like this all the time. He's looking for some help. He's all the time trying to concentrate. He's all the time looking for somebody. Help me out, help me out. All right? If nobody helps him out, then that guy, if he doesn't go get one, all right, then he's just standing at the line of scrimmage and we lost the player in that kind of a situation. The difference between a great blocker and a fair one is the fraction of time between the contact and the follow through. It's called the interval. Press the interval. Snap of the ball to the referee's whistle. All the time trying to finish all your blocks, working on the idea where you're constantly striving to do your job to the best of your ability. Blocking failures, ignorance of assignment, loafing, tipping, right? not mastering your stance, right? lack of aggressiveness or hustle, no hit, poor contact, hitting early or hitting late. Right? Failure to operate from a good base. Right? Duck position. Right? This goes back to the gym. Right? This duck walk and all the kind of stuff that we always did. But those are all philosophies that are built upon position. Right, losing your feet after contact, not bringing your feet with you, not getting overextended, maintaining your center of gravity, lack of confidence in your ability or teammate's ability, your hesitation. Right, you don't want to hesitate at the line of scrimmage. Right, there's a correct and an incorrect way of executing every block. We do not permit a substitute technique. Right? However, I will, and just like, just like Keith said before, you'll change to the ability of your players sometimes. If your guys can't do certain things, then you're not going to do that thing. Or you're going to have to modify that thing to allow that guy to become as good as he possibly can be. All right? Lastly, in the bullshit area, all right? Whatever possible, we'll strive to make the defensive man take the path of least resistance. We're going to try to put our hat between the ball carrier and the defender. We're going to try to keep our body between the quarterback and the pass rusher. Make your man escape around behind you on a run so if he's forced to take the long path of pursuit. Never allow the angle to the ball across your face. All right? Each player must have a good understanding of the total play action. Again, this comes back to concepts. 
Come back to understanding where you fit into the puzzle. It's impossible to position yourself properly or anticipate your man's reaction if you don't have a good understanding of the play. If you don't know where the ball is going or what the aspect of the play is, then you're in serious shit. Right? You've got to figure that stuff out. And again, it's a mental concept. A good understanding of defensive alignments. This is the stimulus response aspect. The idea where you're coaching all week, you got them lined up, blah, 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 blah. Okay, you get them up there, they line up in the defense. Okay, here's the calls, here's the, here's the play, so on and so forth. And it's all based upon that. It all starts with that recognition. That's the stimulus, all right? What's your response? And if they change that, all right, if they change that stimulus, because they give you something you haven't seen or something you haven't worked on, that kid's got to have a conceptual picture in his mind of what the play is and where he can fit himself in. And again, now that's where communication comes in. They got to talk to one another. They got to make their calls. They got to maintain constant communication along the line of scrimmage. All right, prepare to anticipate which defense is alignment's charge. Again, this is film stuff. Taking a look at your opponent, not just looking at how he lines up all the time, but what's the guy doing? What's his favorite move? You know, is he right-handed? Is he left-handed? All right, all those types of things are involved in film stuff. Know the situations in which they most frequently occur. Right? Well, I'm constantly dealing, and, 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 and I'm sure you are too, with the idea of down and distance preparation. Right? Down and distance, also field position situations. With the tools we have at the end now as coaches, we can break down a, 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 a defensive team to the point where, where we know practically what they're going to do in certain situations just by study. And again, that's what your players need. They need that information as well as the aspect of how we're going to handle those types of situations. All right? Build a book. Build a book. Know your guy that you're playing against. Study him. Try to concentrate yourself in those situations. And then, if, if you're going to play against that guy again, hey, write it down somewhere. So when you go back again, it's not a situation where you're restudying that fact. Once you establish a strong running game, all right, a consistent running game, controlling the line of scrimmage, protecting the passer, all right, there will be titles, championships, and a feeling of pride and togetherness that can be never taken away. And that's absolutely the truth. The hackles on my neck still stand up when I think of situations that occurred because of dedication and, term and determination by great offensive line play. All right? Flubies throw in Miami, that kind of a situation. That's all stuff that was brought about by five guys working their ass off all day long. All right? Flutie, again, couldn't have thrown that ball without those five guys out in front of him. And again, that's a key factor all the time. Constantly dealing with those aspects. From the standpoint of philosophy, I really believe that you've got to be tough you got to be nasty. you got to coach them that way. they got to understand that it's not an easy job. You can't be mamby-pamby with these guys. you got to get after them. you got to make them believe. you got to make them understand that it's not going to be easy. No matter what you're doing, it's a constant process and a constant struggle to, to develop yourself as a football player from a technical standpoint. All right, now, as far as the fundamentals of the run line aspect are concerned, the big thing that you got to talk about first and foremost is a player's stance, all right? What kind of stance are you going to take? We'll use a three-point stance from a balanced position, all right? I try to get them to the point where their feet are shoulder width apart. Now, what's shoulder width apart, all right? Shoulder width apart is toes up underneath the armpits, all right? Not feet way out here. I see kids all the time, their feet are way outside their body. When your feet are way outside your body, then you have no power within your framework. Keith said it before, keep everything inside your framework. Absolutely true. You've got more power inside your framework than you ever have outside your framework. You've got to constantly maintain that thought process. Feet, shoulder width apart, toes pointed straight ahead, close to parallel if you can get them. All right? If you can get a kid close to a parallel stance, that's fine. If you can't because he's not flexible enough, then give him the benefit to maybe stagger himself a little bit. All right? Toe in step should be about as far as he needs. I, I don't think he needs to go toe heel. I, strictly, you're talking about the idea where you want to be balanced in your stance. Okay? You want to have the center of gravity between your feet. You want to be able to maintain this balance with 33 and a third percent of your weight balanced off each point. How do they get down? Okay? The way I teach them is your feet are shoulder width apart, toes up underneath your armpits. You're going to bend your knees and put your elbows on your knees. All you're going to do is reach down with your hand that you're going to put down like your eyeball fell out of your socket. Okay? Again, we're dealing with offensive linemen. That's something they can understand. The eyeball fell out of the socket. They can, they can appreciate that. All right? So you're dealing with the idea where your eyeball fell out of your socket. 
You're in a balanced position. I got 33 to a third percent on each point. Very little heel raise. Very little heel raise. Maybe no more than a slip of a piece of paper underneath the heel. That would be about as much heel raise as you need. You put the weight on the balls of your feet. Now again, here we go. Balls of your feet. What, what are they? My offensive linemen, 90% of them aren't anatomy students, so they don't have a goddamn clue what you're talking about. Balls of your feet. What I tell them is look down at your shoes or where your shoelaces start. That's the balls of your feet. That's where your balance ought to be. All right? that's, something they can, that's something they can relate to again. The idea of giving something from a visual standpoint as opposed to an anatomical aspect. So you, start, you, you put your balance right where your shoelaces start, your feet are shoulder width apart, your hand is down like your eyeball fell out of your socket, there shouldn't be any more than six to eight inches of distance between your elbow and your knee. All right? No more than that. Your hand shouldn't be way out in front, of your, in front of your feet. You shouldn't have weight on your hand or much weight on your hand, more than the 33 and third percent that you need to make it a balanced stance. This is a situation that this kid's got to take this stance all the time. It's a constant thing. It's not a deal where he's taking it one time to do one thing, one time to do something else. It's a situation where you're going to take the same stance every time. Why? Because you got to give the defensive, body, the, the defensive guy some credit. Even though he's a dumb shit, you still got to give him some credit. You got to say, hey, he's looking at you. If your hand is way far forward, he knows it's a run. If your hand is way far back, all right, your ass is down, he knows it's a pass. You got to give him credit for that. So you want to give the kid the idea that you got to take the same stance all the time. Don't cheat on your stance. Your stance is like a foundation of a building. All right? You have a good foundation, a solid foundation, you can build anything on. You got a horrible foundation, a terrible situation, you can't build a shit house on it. You want to make sure that you can do the same thing from that same stance all the time without tipping it off. You want to maintain that concept all the time. So your feet are shoulder width apart, your toes are pointed straight ahead, toe in step stagger it great, right? Your hand is down like your eyeball fell out of your socket, six to eight inches of distance between your elbow and your knee, very little heel raise, right? And the ability to go forward, right, left, or back, right, is there within that stance. And it's a constant process. It's a constant process where you're dealing with taking the same stance all the time. You don't want to cheat on your stance. And again, you don't want to give the defender any type of credit from the idea of giving him an opportunity to read your stance or tip your stance. Next thing is the takeoff concept, right? Coming off the ball. Now, I'm probably in a minority, okay? But I'm not a drop step guy, okay? Even though, you know, Jimmy, I think, has a great idea and he, he believes in it. He's a Bible beater, you know, he beats that... He beats that drop step into the ground, everybody loves it. And fine, I, that's fine. But I wasn't, I wasn't taught that way, okay? And, I don't, and, and basically, my guy that I work for, he doesn't believe in it, so I'm kind of I'm uh, tied up anyway in that situation. So I, I'm a lead stepper. A lead stepper is the idea where you're going to come off the ball stepping in the direction of the target without drop stepping, all right? So we're going to lead step. Our first step is going to be only six inches long. All right? I'm not talking about a great big long step here. I'm talking about a six inch step that you can come off the ball, all right? Keep your toe and your knee in a straight line so you're not understepping yourself. And you're in a process where you're keeping what we call a flat back mentality. Okay? We're going to come out and not up. We're not coming up and then out. All right? You're coming out and then up, constantly dealing with that process as well. We're working on maintaining what we call a flat back. Everybody's talking about flat backs all the time, flat backs. All right? And that's what we're dealing with. That's what I'm trying to preach to those guys. Is that we want to be flat back when we come off the ball. The most important thing about the start is, in my mind, the second step. All right? I think you've got to get the second step down as quick as you possibly can. If that guy's right up on your face, and you're taking that six inch step, and that second step better be real fast and real quick. So you can get both points into the ground before you make contact or as you make contact with the defender. Keith said it himself, the idea of punching a guy with both points in the ground. It's the same thing with run block. You've got to be able to create some momentum, create some inertia with two points in the ground. You know that defensive guy is going to have two points in the ground all the time. Shit, the most he ever does is just lead out and maybe step real short. Some of those defensive linemen take better steps than an offensive lineman do sometimes. 
You're constantly dealing with the idea of trying to get that second step down as fast as you can. Make that second step a short step. A short, balanced step is one way I try to preach it. And the idea of coming off the ball is important from staying low. Coming out and not up. So again, putting it all together here from a stance and starts concept, we're talking about feet shoulder width apart, toes pointed straight ahead, hand down on the ground like your eyeball fell out of your socket, very little heel raise, you're going to bend your knees six to eight inches of distance between your elbow and your knee, and your first step is a six inch takeoff. Bang. Your second step is bang, right behind you. So you got both points on the ground as fast as you possibly can. So when you make contact, you have two points on the ground, you can generate some power. All right? You don't push a car. And when it's stuck in the snow, I don't have to worry about this anymore because I live in Jackson. When I lived in Boston, I had to worry about pushing cars in the snow. So I can, again, talk about that. But again, you don't push a car like this. You don't push a car like that with one foot off the ground. Nobody pushes anything with one foot off the ground unless you're one leg. All right? You got both points in the ground and you're pushing that car. All right? This is the same thing, man. That's the same idea. You don't push that car with both points in the ground. I don't push the car like this. So again, that's the concept, that's the idea, that's the mentality you're dealing with, okay? For some guys it's a pickup truck, other guys it's a car, all right? But we're talking about pushing this thing. And the only way you generate any momentum or any movement is with those two points in the ground so you can create that pressure, create that inertia to get started. Make it happen that way. The stance and the starts are very, very important. Something that you gotta deal with you got to have a starting point, right? And that's basically mine, right? Now the center, a little bit different, right? The center's stance and exchange are just a little bit different. We're going to widen the center out just a little bit maybe, okay? We're going to try to keep his knees up underneath his body. You don't want to center with his knees outside like a bullfrog. You want his knees up underneath, right? You want very little weight on the football. Very little weight on the football. We're working from a three-point stance, okay? Some people work from a four-point stance with the other hand down behind the ball. But again, when we work from a three-point stance with the ball, there's no weight on the football. There's no weight on the ball. All your weight is balanced between your feet, 50-50. Okay, and again, as a center, you're going to be asked to do the same types of things that the guards and the tackles are going to do. you got to go right, you got to go left, you got to be able to pull, you got to be able to come back and drop back past. So again, you're not going to tip your stance either. You're going to work on constantly demanding of yourself to be as good or to be as proficient at taking your stance as you possibly can. The exchange situation is the difference here. Right? Now the center's got to play with the ball between his feet, between his legs. Right? And what I do here is I tell the center, you're going to snap the ball to the quarterback like you're pulling a stake out of the ground or you're starting a power more. It's not a looping type of deal. It's not up and in like this. It's like you're pulling a lawnmower. You're starting a lawnmower. Or you're pulling a stake out of the ground here. It's elbow in tight to your body. You're not going to loop it here like this. Because if you loop it, then the point of exchange will change for the quarterback as you move. You're going to pull that stake out of the ground. You're also going to have to step the same time that your arm moves. So it's a snap and a step constantly. It's not a situation where you snap and then you step. You're dealing with the idea where you're going to snap and step together. And you're bringing that ball up. And you want to make sure that the exchange point is automatic for you and the quarterback as a center. That exchange point's got to be the same place every time. So the quarterback doesn't have to worry about that stuff. He doesn't have to make an athletic play before the ball is even handed off or before he even tries to throw it. Trying to take a snap from a guy whose ball's all over the damn place. You're constantly dealing with the idea where you want to automatic that exchange point. Making sure that the center understands us, making sure that the quarterback gives him enough pressure. The other thing that you always want to do as a, as a line coach with the center, now I don't know, maybe my guy is just a, a guy who just, you know, is, this is one of, his, one of his bugaboos, but he wants the center's ass up in the air. He wants the center up in the air so the quarterback doesn't have to bend down like this to take a snap. All right? So again, we're constantly dealing with trying to maintain proper angles of the knees here. And again, what you don't want again is the knees outside the body or you're up on the toes in order to snap. You want to try to maintain the same type of heel raise that the regular linemen have. Alright? And again, now from a center standpoint, you have to be primarily parallel with your feet. You don't want to be staggered because then that changes the exchange point from one point to another. 
right? The center is responsible for hand pressure by the quarterback, all right? He's got to tell the quarterback whether or not he can feel the guy or not, okay? If he can't feel him, he's got to tell the quarterback. Now, you know as well as I do, if you've coached any offensive line, when the ball falls on the ground in the center quarterback exchange, who gets blamed, right? It's never the guy who's taking the snap. It's always the guy who is delivering the snap. It's always his fault. Oh, shit, it wasn't, it wasn't back far enough. Okay? It wasn't the fact that the quarterback was jumping his ass out of there because he didn't want to get hit. Right? It's always our fault. And then believe me, in our line of business, shit rolls downhill. Okay? It always rolls downhill. We're the guy standing at the bottom of the hill. We're all going to get hit with it. Right? Nobody else is going to get hit with it. So as an offensive lineman or an offensive line coach, you got to know your place. You got to understand the, the pecking order and the hierarchy of football. And you got to re be realistic of the fact that, hey, we are the mushrooms. There is no question. All right? Whoever came up with that idea was absolutely, absolutely true. Because we are in the dark all the time, and people do throw shit at us all the time. No question. But as a player and as a coach, we have, we have the fundamental aspect of the game in our control. Because they can't play the game without us. It's like it's our ball all the time. Okay? They can't play the game without us. It's up to us as coaches. It's up to them as players to try to get as good as they possibly can get in what they're trying to do. All right, now, every day in practice, we'll do a stance to starts takeoff, okay? Now, I know they get bored with it, but I don't give a rat's ass. It eats up a couple minutes of my time. But still, it's the idea where we're constantly dealing with the idea of coming off the ball. Getting off the ball low, flat back, trying to take the proper steps, working on the second step situation so it's not bag strike or anything else like that. It's just a situation where we're working on the idea of coming off the ball. That's the first thing we're going to do. Now, if I've got a sled period worked up, then I won't do stance and starts. I'll go over and I'll strike the sled first, just so we get the idea of coming off the ball together. And it's a constant repetition aspect of getting the second step down as quick as, I, as, quick as you can. All right? The next thing we always do is what we call block progression. Bob, this thing is driving me fucking nuts. Okay? Never mind. Never mind. I don't need it. I don't need it. All right? Next thing that we're going to do is what we call block progression. I need a couple of demonstrators here, and i got two guys who played for me. Jackie, you and Darren, please come up here now. I, I know you guys have, have, have done this before, so I don't have to coach you here. I can make out the points, and, and you guys can, uh, can show them what we're talking about. Okay? Now, block progression for us is a four-step situation. All right? And the thing that I do is I start from the block back. All right? We start from the finished product and we work our way back to the stands. Right, this is Jackie Bicknell, he's at Louisiana Tech. Right, Darren Twomley's at Northeastern University in Boston, and both of these young gentlemen played for me, probably to their misfortune. Right now, who's on offense and who's on defense? I'm on defense. You're, huh? He's on offense. He's on offense? All right. So I gotta coach somebody? Yeah. All right, here we go. We're gonna step into the fit position, all right? This is feet shoulder width apart again. And again, if you have a line, I always try to get them on a line so they can get themselves set properly. Feet shoulder width apart, toes pointed straight ahead. You're going to bend your knees, all right? Bend your knees, flippers up and elbows in, all right? And the defender will grab a hold of the elbow position here. What we're trying to maintain here is the arch in the back. Arch in the back. Okay, stand up for just a second. I realize you're old, okay? So what we're looking for there is the arch in the back. We're looking for that position where we're in what I call a power angle. Feet are shoulder width apart, elbows in, hands up. You're in this position right here. And this is how we're going to teach coming off the ball and striking first, all right? I don't want to teach a head block. I'm not head button first. I'm going to teach them to hit with their hands first, their flippers second, and their head is third as a stabilizer, okay? That's the way I'm going to teach them how to block. But I want their hands out in front of them, all right? I want their hands out in front with their elbows in. And their feet are shoulder width apart. They've got the power angle in their back, and they're maintaining that arch position arch duck or whatever you want to call it. All right? But that's a situation that we call the fit. Okay, step up and take a fit. All right? Feet shoulder width apart, toes pointing straight ahead. All right? Okay, stand up and back away. Okay? Now, always do that with them. All right? I do this twice, usually a repetition. Take a fit, stand up and back away, and then step up and take another fit. So they got to go through the checklist. They got to go through the checklist mentally in their mind all the time. This is the perfect block. All right? This is the perfect block. This is like me the other day when I'm playing golf with my kid, all right? I hit a three wood about 250 yards. I, I pissed all over it, as he said. You know, he said, boy, Dad, you pissed all over that three wood. After I hit that ball, I'm looking down, okay, what the hell did I do? Okay? How did I hit that ball that well? 
All right? And this is what I'm trying to make them understand is the idea that this is the perfect block. When it shows up, when it presents itself, then take advantage of it. Take advantage of the situation. Don't be afraid to, you know, step back away from that concept of, wow, how did this happen? You know how it happened. All right? This is the perfect block situation. All right, now the second step of the progression is what we call the walk. All right? Again, it starts from the fit position. This is feet shoulder width apart, toes pointed straight ahead, butt down, elbows in. All right, when I say walk, he's going to walk straight ahead. He's going to scoot his feet. All right, he's going to scoot his feet. He's not going to pick his feet off the ground. He's going to scoot his feet along the ground here like this, trying to keep him in contact with the ground. All right, when I say stop, okay, when I say stop, he's going to stop and hold it so I can check him out. All right, here we go. Take a fit. All right, walk. Stop. All right, good. Come on back. Okay? And again, it's a real short situation. All they're going to do is just take that short, choppy steps. And again, they're not, you know, it's like this. Scoot your feet along the ground. Scoot your feet along the ground. Try to keep your feet in contact with the ground all the time. Try to maintain knee bend. All right? <laughs> Try to maintain position with the screws on your hat. All right? You're not going to raise up. What guys all the time want to do in this situation is here. When they're out here like this and they say, okay, walk, they want to get up here like this and make themselves more comfortable. That's a very uncomfortable situation. All right? Blocking is not a comfortable pastime. It's a very uncomfortable pastime. Okay, and so you're trying to create the situation in their mind. Try to make them think of their hips are on rails. All right? There's rails extended off their hips and they got screws out of their hips. They're like some kind of weird fucking Frankenstein. Alright, they're here like this. Okay? They're walking along like that, screwing their feet along the ground, they're not raising up. They're trying to maintain their position in relationship to the defender all the time. Low guy wins, all those types of aspects. But here's the idea where we're trying to maintain the situation under a progressive concept. And dealing with the idea of the mental practice, the technical aspect. All right? Now, the third step in the progression is probably the one most difficult. All right? This is what I call the hip roll. This is a situation where the guy, can you do this? Oh, Are you all right with this? I don't want to throw your back out. All right? He's going to take a fit. All right, he's going to maintain that first position again. When I say roll him, he's going to roll his hips in. All right, and when I say roll his hips in, I mean I want to see horizontal hip roll this way. I don't want to see vertical hip roll. I want to see horizontal here, bench press away. All right, as he rolls his hips in, his knees will automatically come up. All right, he'll snap his knees up, get the guy up, and then get back down and get another bite. And we do this at the end like a full speed situation. I'll say full speed foot fire at the end. So they're coming off the ball, they're going to concentrate on the hip roll, they're going to extend, they're going to drive the feet back up and finish off the block here in a full speed situation. This is hip roll, hip roll. Now, talk to kids all the time, all right? I used to do the high school camps at Boston College. My favorite type of, of, of the whole camp was when I taught the kids the block progression because I knew I'd always get a laugh with this line, okay? I always say the same thing, okay? We'd go up and we'd say, okay, hip roll, and i try to teach them, teach them through it. Technically, all right? And sure enough, some of them would extend or some of them would just step off, you know, they wouldn't get it right. So I just say, okay, guys, come on, all together, everybody together. Okay, and everybody all come together. Stand there like this. These are high school kids now. I say, hey, how many guys got girlfriends? Oh, fuck, they'd all raise their hand. We all got a girlfriend. We all got a girlfriend. Well, what do you do with your girlfriend on a Saturday night when you're in the back seat of your old man's car? Okay? What are you doing in the back seat? You're going, oh, 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 like this. Okay? You're rolling your hips all over the goddamn place. There's all kinds of horizontal roll. Okay? Now, what I tell them is, hey, if you can't roll your hips on Saturday afternoon, you're never going to roll your fucking hips on Saturday night because they're not going to give it up. <laughs> they're going to be giving it up to somebody else. What you're dealing with here is the idea where you want to roll your hips in. You want to snap. You want to be velocity. You want to have velocity with this. This is ferocious. And you want to squeeze your cheeks and get him toward the opposite goal line as hard as you can and then get that guy up in the air where you're in position but you don't want to maintain this hip roll. You want to get back down as fast as you can. Dip down and get another bite. Right? And maintain that position on a full speed foot fire on the end. Let me do this because I don't want, I don't want you to hurt yourself. Alright? Here we go. Move here this way. Okay? Here we go. I'm going to roll. Okay? Here we go. Oh. Like this. Like that. Get back down. Hard as you can. Try to keep your feet pointed straight up the field. Don't let your feet get outside your body. Don't duck walk, or don't duck your feet. Why? Okay, come here. Put your feet out that way. Point them out that way, like a duck. Okay, now bend your knees. All right, try to come up. Hard to do, right? 
Put your feet up underneath your framework. All right, now bend your knees. Now try to come up, okay? Much easier, right? Try to keep everything inside the framework of your body. Another one, bring your arm up this way. Okay, now try to bring your arm up this way, straight up inside. This is much easier, right? Everything's inside, now, we're not in the army now, okay? This, this is much easier if everything's inside your framework. Try to maintain everything inside the framework of your body. Don't allow your feet to get outside your body. Try to maintain position on the inside of your arch, okay? Again, that is right in here, okay? Point at that and they'll, they'll understand that, all right? It's the whole idea here where you're trying to maintain everything inside the framework of your body. The fourth and final step of the progression is from the, from the stance, all right? This is what we call the drive block. The defender will stand over top of the offensive guy, all right? The offensive lineman, again, puts his hand on the line. I'm a great line guy. All right, puts his hand on the line, the defender gets back, maybe about like this, so the guy can take two short steps. All right, now we're going to put all this stuff together that we've talked about. Take off, first step, second step, contact, hip roll, drive him back, get back down, finish him off. Okay? And this is the drive block aspect of it. That's the fourth step in the progression in that type of a situation. And it's a constant process here. And we do this drill every day, right? We do this drill every day. If I got, you know, they, they get bored and so on and so on. Screw them. Repetition. It's the key to success. Definitely doing something that's an unnatural act. Okay, I don't need you for long, right? Definitely doing something that's an unnatural act. So you're constantly striving in the idea where you're building this repertoire of ability, okay? You're constantly dealing with the idea of making them craftsmen. Technique. Just like they used to say with General Electric, prog progress is our most important, technique is our most important product, right? We've got to be technical. We've got to constantly rely on technique as being an important part of what we do. Yes, Coach? Coach, how do you hold your hands when you climb your stance? What do you mean? Like this? Yeah. I come right up out of the stance. I don't arm whip or anything like that. I know a lot of people like that. I, I, you know, again, believe me, I don't have all the goddamn answers. I don't have the answers, okay? I just follow along what I've done, what I feel is natural. And I've, I've always felt that if you're here like this and you're going to come up, you know, this is a lot of, it's a lot easier to come up here like this than it is to, you know, to do that and try to get it all timed up. Alright? Again, I want to get my hands up fast because I'm making contact with the heels of my hands first. Alright? I'm making contact with the heels of my hands first, my flippers are second, and my head is last, and it's the third part of the concept, and it's the stabilizer. It's not the initial point of contact. We're not coming off the ball straight like this and then putting our hands on the guy. We're going to put our hands on the guy first. <coughs> but again, I don't have all the answers, okay? And I can't say what you do is right and what I do is wrong or what I do is right and what you do is wrong. I'm not going to say that. There's 8,000 ways to skin cats. And that's important that as, a, that as a coach you're able to understand that, that what some guy says up here at the clinic doesn't always mean that it's absolutely the truth, right? One thing that I've always felt that is if you go to a clinic and try to get something out of it, try to bring something back with you. Uh, I was at a clinic here, got, I don't know, maybe about five or six years ago, or maybe it was longer than that, and Dave Levy was here, all right? And Dave, so, uh, he was the guy that was the line coach when O.J. Simpson was a, was a Southern Cal, and, and uh, you know, he's had a lot of great success over his career. And he made a statement standing in front of a bunch of guys like this that, that you know, hey, fuck, again, another ton of bricks idea, all right? He said that I've seen a lot of great players, but not a lot of great coaches. And that's absolutely the truth. You're only as good as the guys you coach. You can coach your ass off. Hey, I've been 0-10 and, and coached my ass off, did, you know, did the greatest coaching job of my life, and I was still 0-10, all right? It's the product you're dealing with. It's the people you're dealing with, all right? And you're constantly trying to make them as good as they possibly can be. If you go 0-10 and, and you can go home and you can look in the mirror and say, hey, I sold my goddamn soul to get this done. I worked my ass off. Hey, believe me, what the hell else can be asked of you as a coach, right? It's the same thing you say to the players. I say to the players all the time, hey, you give me your best effort every day, that's all I can ask. Don't bullshit me, and I won't bullshit you. You try to do your best job every day so you can be as good as you possibly can be, so you can come off the practice field a better player than when you went on. Hey, believe me, we've both done our job. But if one of us comes short, if he doesn't do his job, if he doesn't work hard enough at it, okay, that's not always your fault. All right? Sometimes that's, that's the nature of the beast. There's nothing you can do about that. But you're just talking about the idea where you want to improve these people to the best of their ability, and you're constantly dealing with the small parts. All right? 
like my wife always says, it's the little things that count. And this is one of those deals. We're constantly working on the little aspects here. All right? The next thing that we always do, the next thing that we always do is what we call bag and board drills. I got a couple of these that I like. Very simple. Everybody's got those boards, you know. They're now they're rubberized. I remember when they used to be two by, or they used to be uh, two by tens, and uh, they were wood, so you could tell them, hey, you don't want to step on the board. You don't want to get your board. You don't want to get your feet too close to the board. You get splinters. Now we can't say that to them anymore because they're all rubberized. But we're talking about the idea of coming off the wall together, and again, all it is is a reaffirmation. It's a reaffirmation of what you've done in the block progression. It's hand at the end of the board. Dummy holder far enough away from the guy. The hand is at the end of the board here. All right. Dummy holder about th far, far enough away from the guy so, so, the, so the guy can get his two steps down. But it's just a takeoff drill. If you got a sled, you do it on a sled. All right. I, I prefer bagging boards because, you know, when you're working with eight or nine guys, it's tough to strike a sled. And you got seven pads up there. So we'll use a bagging board situation. But all the time we're talking about coming off the ball, you're coming out and not up. Okay? I used to do this with shoots, shoots, bags, and boards. This used to be the, the first part of it. All right? We've eliminated the shoots, so now we just do bagging boards. We're talking about coming out and not up, making contact, rolling hips, driving the, 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 the bag back across the end of the board. Okay? Across the end of the board. All right, now, talking about how you set up a drill, everybody's all the time talking, well, who goes where? You know, how do we rotate this thing? Okay, fine. You have a third party guy. Okay? Again, this is for guys with a lot of players. All right? You got all your guys back here. Okay? You got a blocker, you got a dummy holder, and you got a third party guy. All right? The third party guy stands behind the end of the board. All right? Strike the bag, blow the whistle, or tell them to stop, whatever they did at the end of the drill. All right? The third party guy now grabs the bag, right? The blocker now becomes the third party guy, and the bag holder goes to the end of the line. It's a real simple rotation. That way nobody gets confused. You're not saying you're not standing there, they're not doing Alphonse and Gaston on you when you only got three minutes and you're trying to get it done. Okay? So everybody knows what the rotational concepts are. Right? But you're talking about just coming off the ball. Coming off the ball, striking the bag, rolling your hips, bringing your feet through. Don't leave your feet back behind. Try to keep your hips up underneath you all the time. Working on the idea of drive blocking the bag straight back. Again, aiming point, dead down the middle of the bed. All, right? all we're talking about here is just dead down the middle of the bed. Not talking about anybody's going to move or anything like that. Just dead down the middle of the bed, between the two numbers that are on the shield. All right? The next thing that we'll do in the same concept is what we call angle boards. All right? Angle them off like this. Again, I'm not a great drawer, but there's, there's a line here, and these three boards are, you know, that's bullshit. Okay. Definitely wasn't an artist, all right? They're going to line up here, offset their shoulder. If the, bat, if the boards are angled off here, they're going to offset their shoulder off the right. You'll see it on the videotape, all right? You're going to offset the board. You're going to angle the board this way, offset your shoulder off the right, put the bag close to the end of the board, all right? Now what I'm looking for here now is footwork, all right? I'm looking for this guy to pick his foot up and step, all right? I want him to step in the direction that he's taken off. All right? He's going to come right straight down the board. Again, you got the bags with the numbers on it. Now you're going to treat this guy like an offset player, so you're still going to take your step at it, all right? And you're going to try to maintain midline contact of the board. All you want to do is just take this guy right dead down the board from this position. The big thing here is the step, all right? The big thing here is the step. The idea where you're going to pick your foot up and step. Okay? You're going to pick your foot up and step. You get your second step at about half crotch lane, and your work is dead down the line, right, on the board. But you got to pick your foot up and step. You can't pivot, okay, or you can't false step inside yourself in order to get back down this board. This teaches a lot of things, all right? Number one, if you're on the back side of a play, all right, and I'm trying to cut off a three technique on the back side. All right, or I'm trying to help a guard with a reach block on the back side off a three technique. All right, I don't want that tackle to pivot step or just turn his foot and go. I want him to pick his foot up and eat up some ground. I want him to create some inertia, create some momentum. 
So when he gets there and he strikes it, right, he's got something going for himself. If he just pivots and turns or steps inside himself, he's lunging now to get there. And again, all his weight and all his center of gravity is way back behind him. You want to bring your feet, your balance, and your body together. And the only way you do that is by, by stepping with your feet. You can't allow your feet to hang back behind you. You've got to bring your feet with you all the time. You never want to leave your feet hanging back behind. You constantly want to strive on the idea where you're getting everything back up underneath yourself and you're creating momentum in that direction. Again, all we want to do here now is just take this guy, again, down this board, on that angle right there, on that angle right there, on that angle right there, and not turn our shoulders. We're not trying to hook this guy. It's not a, it's not a hook block. This is a drive block on the angle. All we want to do is just create that momentum that way, take that guy off, and put him on that angle properly, and not turn our shoulders. Take the proper step and get the guy going that way. All right? The thing that I equate this to, all right, is this. If I'm a center and there's a nose guard here on my shape, all right, and I got to block this guy, I'm not going to step out here and try to turn him this way. I'm going to step at it. And again, take my same point of attack that I took here on the boards, all right, and all I'm going to do is try, try to get this guy going backwards. Now, this way. If he flattens out on me, fine. I know that I'm either going to get cut back or I'm going to run him into some pile somewhere along the line. All right? But all I want to do is maintain this position here. I don't want to get out here or try to turn my shoulders here or try to hook this guy. This is a guy I'll come across my face this way. All right? Now, if I can overtake this guy in a hurry, I can get off the ball faster than he does. I'm into him midline area. I got my feet up underneath me and I'm pushing this way. And he's coming back off the ball. Sooner or later, he's going to try to get off me to make a play. Like all defensive linemen, they want to hear their name on the loudspeaker. All right? So, what I want to do now is when I get to that position, he starts to get up here like this. Now I want to turn. Now I want to honk his ass and take him vertical. All right? But not before. I don't want to try to create that position. We don't want to position block anybody. You don't position block anybody. You attack people. You attack people by moving your feet through the lanes. All right? And this is one of those situations where, again, you're taking this guy off on this line, and you're constantly driving in that kind of a situation. All right? Do it right, then you do it left. All right? Do it right, do it left. Okay? Then, all right? and these are all bagging board drills. <coughs> T-boards. T-boards. All these board companies, Rogers and Gilman and all those guys, they all sell these little short tees. Okay? Put those tees at the end of your board. Right? And what they're there for is you put the guy's feet up against the board. Put your guy's feet right up against that tee. Right? And you tell that kid that he's got to get over that board with two steps and get both his points in the ground before he strikes the bat. Okay? If he hits the bag, before he gets a second step down, then you know he's taking too long a second step. And this is a good drill for the kid. It's also a good check for you to make sure that the guy is getting his second step down quick. This T-board situation is a fundamental concept. All you want to do is step over that board, make your contact, roll your hips, and drive the guy back. And again, they can, see, they can check each other out. They can stand and hey, his step's too long. Okay? He, he, you know, his step's way too long, coach. All right? And I'll ask him. I'll, I'll point a guy out. What, what's the matter with that? His steps are too long. Again, we're not on tape. We're out there on the field. They can see it. They can visualize it. And the thing that you're trying to, again, concentrate here on is the idea where you want to get the second step down as fast as you can. All right? Another drill that we'll do in this kind of a situation here with the three bags there is what I call a finish drill. All right? They'll come off the ball, strike the bag, drive it back to the length of the board. The three dummy holders will be holding the, board like, holding the bag like this, and they'll be watching me. I'll point in a direction. Those guys will turn and run with the bag. I want the blocker now to turn and run with that guy. All right? And maintain position with him. Finish the guy off. Finish the guy off. What are we always telling people? Finish that guy off. No, okay, fine. What drill do you have where you work on a finish? It's very seldom. This is one that you can actually work on a finish concept with these guys. We're dealing here with the idea of trying to equate the drills to something that is important to them fundamentally. The T-board is a second step situation, straight ahead situation is the concept where you're going to get your second step down, you're going to maintain your body level, keep your shoulder pad level down, you're, you're coming out and not up. All right? The angle board is the idea of picking your feet up and getting yourself in proper alignment with the target, any point dead down the line, that kind of stuff. The finish drill, the idea of finishing a guy off. Give them a reason as to why you're doing it, not just out there eating up 10 minutes of time now. You're trying to create something that's going to be a learning process for them. That's what we're there for. 
We're there to teach them and make them as good as they possibly can be. And again, the way you do that is by constantly re reinforcing what you're trying to teach as far as the fundamental aspects are concerned. All right, sled situations. All right, we're dealing with sled, with sled drills and stuff like that. We have a seven-man Roger sled. All right, where we'll drive the sled. And again, I don't want them to pick it up. I want them to keep their backs flat and push the sled with a back, with a, with a flat back aspect. Not allowing themselves to get up into that hip roll where everybody's up here like this and you know they'll drop the damn sled and break it or somebody will fall down and they'll end up falling the sled on them and stuff like that. I want them to just drive the sled. Keep their backs down. Keep their backs flat. Keep their hips up underneath them. Bringing their feet with them all the time. Constantly talking about bringing their feet with them. Alright? Now if you don't have a lot of room and you got to anchor your sled, then the idea of picking the sled up, that's a possibility where you can put the sled up against the wall or up against the fence, the idea of driving it. And again, now here, I'm talking about the idea where I don't want their head to touch the pad. All right? I want their hands out in front, and I want them to pick up that sled with their hips and their legs, not with their arms. They're not going to go like this, like this. They're going to drive it. They're going to get here like this. All right? Maintain that position there. Roll their hips and pick the sled up that way with their hips and their legs. But it's a, it, it, again, it's a, it's a concept of what you have available to you from the standpoint of equipment. Sleds are important, important products. I mean, they're, they're, they're important to us as line coaches. Everybody remembers if you were a lineman that you were out there hitting the sled. I mean, yeah, that's important. And, and, and I believe in that. You got a Ray Carruthers sled. I know Jimmy always talked about those drills that, that, that he got from guys where they used to do that, that flipper concept. Where they would be down on, where they be down on, on, on all fours here, like this, and they make contact. Let's say we're striking with the right shoulder, they're making contact with that triangle with their elbow, their hand, and their shoulder, and their contact here is like this. And again, it's teaching this aspect here, where you're rolling your hips, you're constantly doing that. I mean, everybody's done that belly flopper drill where you're down on, and you're down on all fours, and you're going to extend into the sled, and the sled goes away from you, and everybody falls down. It's the same principle here. Right? All you're doing is reinforcing the idea of hip roll. Constantly stressing those aspects there. Okay? Now, from the standpoint of what I'd like to cover here, right, there's only one thing that I'd like to do and just give you an idea. And again, this is food for thought. I know these other guys are going to talk about this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it. Right? But zone blocking principles in, in, in today's football is important. Right? And one of the things that you're dealing with here is the idea of how to read that zone. And again, uh, Bob talked about the tough technique. I call it a hump technique for the guard and the tackle. And all we're doing there is the idea where the tackle's going to come off and his aiming point, if the guy is head up on him, is going to be two inches outside the midline. If he's in a five technique outside, then my aiming point is down the midline. All I'm going to do is come off and I'm going to stay on the tracks. I'm not going to try to get off those tracks. I want to block the guy on the tracks. I want the guard to be the adjuster. The guard will be the adjuster in the situation. He'll tell the tackle where to go. Right? When we do this with a hump concept, all we're doing here is the guard's going to take a flat step. And again, it's a one-hand push to start off with. And that linebacker over top of him can do one of three things. He can either hang there, he can go, go, go to stack, stack right behind the five technique or the four technique, or he can go out to the outside there on some kind of a game. Now, if that linebacker hangs and all I do is take my flat step, one hand push, I'm going to stay on this push right here with the one hand. I'm not going to mire my head. I'm going to try to keep my shoulders square, all right? And then I'll get off where the, where the linebacker is. I'll get off that block where the linebacker is, just like getting off at the train station. If that guy goes to a stack position, now I'm going to end up with two hands on this. As soon as that guy goes to stack, I'm going with two hands on this and I'm pushing like hell. All right, but I'm not burying my head. I'm not going to bury my head into the block. I'm not going to mire my head in that block. I'm going to keep my head out. I'm going to keep my eyes on that linebacker. So if he's in stack, all we're going to do is double that down lineman right to that linebacker. Now that linebacker comes off to the inside, the guard can get off. Or if he decides he's going to pop out over the top, all i got to do is displace the tackle now from that position. Now if the linebacker runs out over the top, my one hand is out here like this, I see the linebacker run. Now my eyes automatically go to the down lineman and I'm going to feel this guy with my hands. As soon as that guy goes over the top, now I'm going to displace the tackle off. All the tackle's doing is working in a straight line. He's working railroad tracks. 
He's working railroad tracks. And this is equated to the guard and the center, okay? Just like it's equated to the guard and the tackle, and it's also equated to the tackle and the tight end, whether the bubble player is over one of those guys. And you're working that kind of a zone situation. But that one technique handles all three of those situations for those guys. And again, the big stress there is that the fact that the linebacker is he's there, and he can only do one of three things. That's all he can do. The other thing is the backside pressure of this play. All right? When we run that zone play, that inside zone, we're looking for a cutback concept. Right? And so what we're trying to press on the backside, and I'm sure Howard's going to talk about it, is the vertical aspect, where you want to try to create vertical out of the down guy with the double team somewhere along the line. If they're in an under front, if they're in an under defense, they're like that. This guy's on the, on the scoop. These two guys here are on the hump to this situation there. We're trying to just flatten that guy out, all right? We know the back's working the backside edge. These two guys now have the critical job of creating the trench right there because we know that guy's probably going to go that way unless he's on a game, right? That guy's going to attack the inside leg of the tackle. As soon as he presses the feet of the lineman, then he's going to break it back off the next guy to the inside. He can't find him. And again, this is the big thing backside vertical push. It's important on the zone concept, especially the inside zone when you're talking about the cutoffs on the backside. You're talking about the ability to break it back in that kind of situation. But again, that's as far as that situation goes right there. Again, I don't want to take anybody's time or, 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 or effort in that kind of situation. But again, what I'm trying to deal with here is the idea of fundamentals. And again, those aspects there that we talked about from a fundamental standpoint, now you take them over and you, and you, and you move into a group concept whether it's guard and tackle together or whether it's all five of them together, or even the tight end is involved at times. Now you're dealing with the fundamental techniques that these guys know, they have knowledge of, and then all you're dealing with now is the idea where you're trying to stress those techniques within the framework of a scheme and dealing with the ideas of staying low, coming off the ball, getting the second step down, getting your hands out in front, rolling your hips through all your brows, bringing your feet with you, all those types of things that we deal with from that standpoint. All right, now let's just take a look at this tape here and show the tape. This is black. Did you get the white guys? This is Stance's start drill. Okay? And again, I mean, it's a very simple concept. I mean, everybody does it, Pop Warner, so on and so forth, and we do it in the NFL. And you're constantly dealing with the idea of proper alignment along the line of scrimmage, getting them lined up right. You don't want to look like a swept wing dodge. You want to stay on the line of scrimmage, proper alignment. My guy is a big guy on everybody being straight across. He doesn't like in and up. And, you know, I can't do a lot of, I can't do a lot of, of vertical splitting, so I try to maintain this position. And the way we line up is to tell the center, uh, tell the center to take his position over the ball. The guard will align with his toes on the center's heels, and the tackle will align with his toes on the guard's toes. So we're straight across the ball all the time. Left hand stance on the left side, right hand stance on the right side. And again, trying to stay down, trying to maintain solid takeoff here. Try to step, step off properly. Now you're varying your cadence counts, right? You're going to vary your cadence counts. You're going to go on one. You're going to go, to go on two. You're going to go on the second number. All the time along with that, you're dealing with the idea where you want the center to be involved as well, all okay? right? So you're going to try to get... You're going to try to get the center to make the exchange, all right? Just make the exchange. Now, I'm not much of an athlete, but I, I don't bother with any snaps. I don't understand why these guys always have these snap problems all the time. It's not that difficult a procedure as long as you maintain pressure. Again, trying to maintain position. Stand. All right, coming back, same thing. Very the cadence count. Same thing. All right, next thing we'll do, we'll put our foot against the line. Here, put your foot against the line. Not on it or over it, but against it. And now you're going to pull in that direction. So you're working on a pull technique here. Throw your elbows back. 
right? Throw your elbow back like you got a rebound in basketball. Step it over the line. You always want to step over the line. Get your hips open to the target. And again, centers as well as guards and tackles are doing this kind of a concept here. All right, coming back. All right, this is our block progression here. All right, here's the fit. This is the fit position here. Again, some of these guys aren't real good. Uh, Wydell's a little bit forward here in his body position. All right, this is the walk now. Scoot your feet. Stop. Hold it. Okay? Do that once. Now it's the hip roll. All right? Now it's the hip roll. You can always tell the guys who are the good breathers here. All right? You can always tell the guys who know how to breathe. All right? Some of these guys aren't as good breeders as others. What you're looking for here is hip roll. You want explosion, velocity, ferociousness. All right? Really sink it in. Roll it through. Finish off at full speed. Try to stay down. Get down and get another bite. All those types of things. Extend your arm. The guy here's not doing a great job on arm extension. All right now, here's the here's the here's the finished product right here. Just a straight off concept here. Where you're just trying to get yourself off. Keep your pad level down. And take position. Roll your hips through it. Put your feet up underneath you. Okay. All right, bags and boards. Why is that coming out of your shoes? Uh, basically because they never bought me a set. If I had them, I'd use them. All right? They, never, they, they didn't buy me one, and you know, I didn't want to. I was just happy to be there. I wasn't going to ask for anything extra. So, so talk about the hands. You're not going to wind up and shoot the hands right now? Try to shoot their hands right now. All right? Get your hands up in front of yourself right now. And again, Bob, I don't know if that's right or wrong. I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, it's just the idea that, you know, it's it's something that I thought was a was a was a conservation of energy and, and the idea that it, it made for quick contact. Again, we're just trying to, you know, stay down low, come off the ball. Again, flat back concept. Stay down. See, he's whipping his a little bit. You know, you know, he's got his hands right up into it right now. Coach, bag holder trying to initiate contact. Huh? Bag holder trying to initiate No, bag holder is just standing there trying to create resistance. All right? We're not coming forward with him. All right? All we want to do here is just create a target and allow the ability to come off the ball a little and bring your feet in. <coughs> We're looking for a little bit more resistance than this. All right, here's the angle board now. Pick the step, pick up the step, pick up the feet, take the step. Keep your pad level down, aiming point the midline. <coughs> Stepping in that direction, drive them off. So you get to watch this from the player No, nah, I don't, they don't, <laughs> I don't take, I, I can't take drills. I don't, not, I don't have the ability to take drills. They won't allow me to do this. Now this is, I mean, this is, uh, like this Bob said, this smuggled. was smuggled. This was smuggled, okay? Unbeknownst to a lot of important people. Because they're always using the tape, they're always using the, the, the cameras for something else. Now again, man, hey, believe me, you're the, you're the forgotten children here. You know, in more ways than one. But again, this is just several of them here. It's the idea of taking the proper step, taking the step, picking the feet up, all the time working in that situation. And this is it. Same type of situation, coming back this way, try to step at the end, at the end. Thanks, 
Yeah, just the idea of bags, bag drills. I mean, you can you can do as many things as you want with bags that, that you could possibly come up with. I mean, you know, you do down blocks, you do you pull and trap concepts. I mean, bags are, are, are great for linemen. You're not striking hat on hat and doing all that other kind of stuff, and you're, you're working on your fundamental concepts. You're trying to target a guy and doing things right from that situation. All right, now, next thing that I want to talk about is pass protection, all right? We're talking about drop back pass here, and the idea of, again, fundamental concepts here. Position and pass protection, all right? Your position and pass protection is basically the same as it is in run blocking. Your feet are going to be shoulder width apart. I don't want the guy like Keith said today. He was watching, you know he said that guy's feet are too wide. I don't want those guys with their feet way far apart. Their feet have got to be up underneath them so they can adjust and react to the pulls and the twists and all the types of stuff that these guys are doing to them. So we're we're constantly dealing on the idea of trying to keep your feet up underneath yourself. Get your feet shoulder width apart if you can. All right. Try to maintain toe instep stagger with your inside foot up. So if I'm a left tackle. Okay, if I'm a left tackle, then my right foot is up. If I'm a right tackle, then my left foot is up. All right? And I have toe in step stagger at all times. My feet are shoulder width apart. All right? My hands are up, my elbows are in. I want to try to window the guy. Okay? Now this is something that we used to talk about all the time, windowing. All right? Where you got the guy between your thumb and your and your forefinger, and you got him in your window. He's in here. Now you can't window from down here, all right, unless you're living in you know, a real tall house. All right? You're talking about the idea of getting your hands up, elbows in all the time and you want to maintain that position now the thing with your back is the idea of trying to create that situation with that sit down right you want to bend your knees again right and again there shouldn't be there shouldn't be a lot of weight forward your balance should be again where your shoelaces start that's where your that's where your balance should be there and between your knees all the time between your knees in this situation Right? You don't want your balance way out in front of yourself here because you come top heavy. You don't want it back here. You don't want to be sitting way back here on your heels and then you become soft. Right? There's a fine line. It's like everything else in life. You've got to learn all the proper situ all, the, all the proper concepts so you don't fall into the you know, you fall into the mistake areas. And so if your feet are shoulder width apart, right, and you're in that position right there, and your elbows are in and your hands are up, you're in that concept right there. That's a pass protection position. Your back is arched, your head is back, your eyes are up, okay? I mean, we used to talk all the time about tucking your chin, all right? Get your chin back, you know, just tuck your chin. Get in that position. Again, it's an uncomfortable concept. It's an uncomfortable situation. They don't want to be in that position very long. So we're all the time striving on the idea of trying to maintain that position, hold that position through contact, through, through, the, through the idea of the, prior to contact, when the guy is approaching you, you want to stay down. You want to always maintain that concept and stay down in that position there. Okay? And one of the things that, that you're dealing with from the standpoint of pass protection position is, you know, how do you want to move your feet? All right? How do you want to move your feet? Footwork, like Tunch said today, right? Footwork is an important part of what you're going to do. And you're constantly doing the dance, as Keith said it. All right, and, and, and believe me, we're all plagiarists, we're all chameleons, I call it, we're all chameleons, we're all going to follow what somebody else does. Again, an original thought is not a large, large part of what we do, but the idea of, of footwork, maintaining body position, all those types of things are all part of being a good pass protector. A good pass protector must have patience. He's got to wait for that guy, okay? He's got to wait for that guy and then make his stab, time up his stab, as I call it. All right? We're going to time up your stab properly as the point of attack. When the guy gets to you within the range, now you're going to stab it and sit yourself back. All right? But it is a timing situation, and you're going to maintain patience. You've got to be able to move your feet. All right? We have a post foot. We have a set foot. Our post foot is our inside foot. That's the foot that's up. Nothing should go across that to the inside. Your set foot is your outside foot. Okay? Now, in my philosophy, your outside foot is the foot that makes you move, right? Your outside foot makes your inside foot move. You never, your inside foot should very seldom make your outside foot move. Only in certain situations. Those are rare, right? But most of the time, your outside foot's going to make your inside foot move. 
But realistically, from the standpoint, you've got a post foot, you've got a set foot, all right, and you try to maintain that position. The reason we call it a post foot is because it's driven into the ground, all right? It's driven into the ground. Nothing gets across that to the inside. Your set foot, again, is the one that moves. It tries to create the set, creates the movement, all right? And again, allows you to move in that position from side to side or wherever you're going to go in that type of situation, whether it's a kick slot, okay, or whether it's a side to side maneuver, all right? One of the things that I found, one of the things that I found important was the idea where a guy who's pass protecting has got to learn how to maintain the position. Right? Now, how do you teach them to maintain the position? You tie a rope from here to their scrotum, and you say, "Okay, fine, you can't raise up any higher than that." Okay, no, you get you get arrested. They take your ass away in a, in a, in a truck. Right? No, you want to try to maintain this position by creating situations for them so they have to put themselves in that position and move in that position, right? And that's one of the things that... And again, I mean, you know, these are all drills that... Some of these drills we did back in Marshall, you know? Fuck, I got it. I, I told three or four guys, well, Coach, what are you going to talk about? Same goddamn shit I talked about last time I was here. That was eight years ago. That's how much I've learned. All right? You take three bags, all right? Take three bags and you set them equidistant apart. You know, maybe about, I'd say maybe about three feet, maybe a foot and a half, all right? And they're step over bags. They're not, they're, they're not big round bags. They're about six inches off the ground, all right? Uh, World Sporting Goods in Mobile, Alabama used to make these what I call half rounds, which were like that round dummy, but they were cut in half, and they were just right. They were about that high off the ground, and they laid on the ground, and if you stepped on them, all you did was they squished up like this, they didn't kick all over the damn place, all right? Uh, Rogers makes an agile bag, but that agile bag is a little too high for me. I don't like it that high, all right? We had some, uh, I had my equipment guy take, the, take that rubber out of that pad and cut it down so it's smaller. So it's only like six inches high, right? And again, all I want the guy, all I want this drill to try to affect is the idea and the ability to move over a bag, right? To move over a bag in a lateral fashion that way, right? And again, the way they do this is by stepping over the bag. They're not going to hop over. It. They're not going to cross over. It, okay? They start out. They're all lined up here. Okay, I'm over here. I'll say ready, the first guy ups down in the position, he's free to move and his hands are going, okay? And then I'll say go, all right? And he goes across <coughs> the bags. When he gets to the second bag, the next guy goes. And all we're going to do is go over the bags, all right? But we're going to step over the bags. We're going to work ourselves to the bag and step over it, okay? And the idea of proper pass protection position. Like Keith said, you don't want to allow yourself to get into a situation where you've got both points off the ground for a very long period of time. All right? So we're going to work over the bag, step over the bag, work the bag, step over it, chop up in between the bag. All right? Your head is up, your butt is down. All right? Your hands are up. I'm standing over there, you're looking at me, you're not looking down at the bags. Okay? You want to step over the bags and work yourself to the end of the bags. Now, when everybody goes through, you turn around and bring them back the opposite way. So they got to step the other way. Okay? I think this is a good situation here where they're used to working in the idea of not looking down, developing what I call kinesthetic sense, okay? What's kinesthetic sense? The ability of your body or your head to know where all the parts of your body are at one point in time without having to check it all out. Right, here it is, it's all right here, all right? I know it's here, okay? Kinesthetic sense, the ability to know what your feet are doing without looking at them all the time, all right? So what we're doing here is the idea where we're trying to get across the bed, step and work over the bed, and pick your feet up. All right? Don't hop over. All right? Don't cross over. You step over. And then you work yourself to the next bag and step over. And you're constantly moving and working yourself in a flat lateral idea where you're not going to turn your body this way. You're not going to look down at the bags. You're going to try to maintain this position. All right? Next drill I do in the same setup. Okay? Now they'll be standing there and then I'll be standing here facing them. All right? Now I'll have the guy go through the bags this way, all right? Shuffling through the bags. Now this is kind of a misnomer here because what I want them to do is develop a kick slide or a power step if they work across their inside foot, 
Okay? So if I'm a right tackle, and here are the three bags, okay, I'm a right tackle, I'm going to kick slide this way, all right, get to the end of the bag, back up straight, come across with a power step this way, all right, and kick slide back this way, back up that way, come across power step. So I'm working on my footwork here. But all the time, I'm maintaining proper position, all right? Head gear down, head gear up, butt down, elbows in, knees bent, sitting in the chair, whatever you want to call it. Okay? That's all part of this. And your job as the coach is to monitor that. Make sure they're staying down. Don't stand up. Stay down. Don't look down at the bags. Try to keep your shoulders square. Keep your hands up. All these things these kids got to remember all the time. Make it a habit. Make it a habit. So they're moving and controlling their body in space while they're in this position. That's, again, a very uncomfortable one. But again, if they can move going through these drills, then hopefully in the game they can maintain that position when they have to move in order to get to the pass block situation that they are presented with. All right? So you're constantly working on moving all the time. All right? Next drill, spread the bags out just a little bit more. <coughs> Put the guy straddling the bag. Have the defensive guy, the next guy in line stand over here. You're standing back here behind him. You're going to give this defensive guy a, a move, okay, or a, or a direction. You're going to say, okay, you're going to go this way, or you're going to go that way. All right? That guy on my command, I'll say ready. The guy straddling the bag with his back to me is in the position. His feet are down, his hands, his butt is down, or his hands are up. His head's back. He's moving his feet like this. He's looking at the guy. All right? He's going to mirror this guy over the bag. It's only a two-move situation. We're not looking for contact here. I'm just looking for the ability of the guy to move. Off the, off the spot, to a spot, and come back across the bag, okay? So if I say to go this way right here, this guy's gonna come here, he's gonna follow him over, come back here, step over the bag, and finish off there, all right? Just stop and finish. The thing that this gives you is, again, what Keith was talking about, about the idea of balance, okay? Or lean, you don't wanna lean, all right? You wanna maintain position with the balance between your feet. You want to make your feet bring your body back across the bag, not your body bring your feet back. You're constantly dealing with that aspect where your feet are the important ingredient here. Pass protection is like playing defense in man-to-man -man basketball, right? Your job in man-to-man -man basketball is to keep the defender away from the hoop, right? Hey, your job in pass protection is the same thing. You keep your defender away from the quarterback, right? You maintain body position with him. Now the techniques are a little bit different for sure, but it's the same procedure. If they've played man-to-man -man defense and basketball, they can have a pretty good feel for this concept just from the standpoint of what you're trying to do here. But the whole idea here is to bring your feet back across. Make your feet bring your body back. Not your, not your body bring your feet back. You don't want to lean. Okay? I call this a chop, chop, and never stop drill where your feet are all the time moving. All right? You're going to come off that bag, your feet are moving, you're going to chop, 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 and come back and bring your feet back this way. Okay? Make your feet bring your body back. Don't make your body bring your feet back. You're not going to lean back in that direction. Right? Movement drills are important. Right? You've got to try to stress the movement aspects where they're constantly striving to move while holding and maintaining the position. What are they all? They all the time they want to stand up. They want to make themselves more comfortable. Your job is to make sure that they stay down. Keep their, keep their eyes up, right? their head back, their butt down, their hands up, and they're moving all the time. Constantly striving in that kind of situation. Right? We also do a stab situation. Right? Now this is what I this is what you know uh, touch called the punch aspect, and I call it a stab. Right? We teach this a couple of different ways. Right? The first way that we do it, we used to have a drill way back when we used to call it cage flipper, right? Where one guy held a bag and the other guy was on his knees. They were both on their knees. One guy held the bag and the other guy didn't hold the bag, and the other guy was on offense, and the other guy's facing me like this, okay? And all they did was bring the bag up, and I just whipped up into the, whipped up into the bag like that, okay? So all I did with this now was say, okay, fine. That guy's got the bag up front. You're up in that window position here like this. When that guy brings that bag forward, back, step. Back, press, back, press. Press and hold, all right? Stab and hold, stab and hold. Constantly just working, bang, like that, bang, like that, okay? And what you're doing here is developing that punch, okay? that he's talking about, the idea of striking with the heels of the hands, very important, elbows in, head back, trying to keep your head away from it, 
right? You don't want to come forward this way. Your hips are not involved. You don't have to use your feet here because everything's, everything's concrete now. So all you're doing is concentrating on this one little procedure, all right? Just this one little stab thing like this. <coughs> and then they can just flip the bag over and then it's the other guy's turn. And again, it's a conservation of time. It's a conservation of energy. It's a situation here where you're, where you're zeroed in on one aspect. And what's that one aspect? That boom, that little boom, that little punch. Whatever you want to call it. Punch or stab, I call it a stab. Okay? But here's the idea where you're just doing it this way. All right? Another way that you do it, Marty Gilman sells these balls. They're about the size of a beach ball. All right? They're orange. And they're weighted. All right? I got a little bit of weight to them. You get the guy set in the position. The other guy's standing over there, and he's got the ball up here like this. You're in that position right there. And he throws the ball at you. All right? And you bang, time up that stab. If you hit it right, the ball goes right back to the guy. Okay? If you hit it wrong, if you hit it like a volleyball, then it either goes high or it goes low in the direction that you push it. All right? But if you punch it, if you punch it, it ends up going back right. And again, you're striking with the heels of your hands. No footwork here. I haven't talked at all about footwork. I'm talking all about movement. All I'm talking about is that stab situation. Just making the stab. Making the stab concept work for it. Other thing that we like to do, along with this procedure, is what we call set stab. All right? Now, you're developing the aspect of the set. Okay? As an offensive player, as an offensive player, you can have one of three sets. You can have an outside set when the guy is shaded outside of you. You can have an inside set when the guy is shaded inside of you. Or you can have a head set when the guy is head up on top of you. All right? Now, the head set can be either an inside set or a straight up and down concept. Whatever is your choice. But you've got to make that choice prior to the situation occurring. If the man is playing you head up, you've got to have a feel for what you want to do, how you want to protect yourself. Right? But as far as the outside set is concerned, the guy's on the outside shoulder. All, right? all I'm going to do is pick my foot up, set my foot down. I want to maintain outside foot to crotch on this guy. I want to target my focus on the, in, on the tip of his inside number. All right? Again, keeping my head back, keeping my hands up. And again, all I'm talking about here is just the proper set. Just the proper set. I don't want to overset this guy. Okay? What do I mean by overset? I don't want to get foot to foot with him. Okay? I don't want to get into a position where he can take me back inside. I've already got the advantage by his alignment. So all I got to do is pick my foot up and set it back down and maintain that position. If he's a little bit wider than a five technique or a, or a three technique, he might be a little bit wider, then I might have to widen myself out a little bit. But I'm not going to move my inside foot if I don't have to. The only time I move my inside foot is when I get myself into a position where I'm out, where I'm starting to get out of whack, out of bounds. Now I'm going to have to slide myself back up underneath. But again, we're talking about a wide set now, not, not just a, a five technique or a three technique or for the center or shaded nose guard. Now, right or wrong, I always teach the center, hey, separate a little bit. Get away from that guy or something. You're not, like the, you're, you're not like the other offensive linemen. The other offensive linemen have the length of the football plus, in our situation, the length of the center's body. All right? The center, I always taught, hey, snap the ball, get yourself back away from that guy. Separate a little bit. You've got to separate yourself some. You've got to maintain that position. All right? Outside foot to crotch is what you're going to shoot for here. If the guy is head up on you, all right? Now it's up to what you think is right for you. If you feel you got a, you feel you got a guy over here that you can handle and you want to pick your foot up and set it down with the outside foot, that's fine by me. If that guy goes back down inside, then I'm going to reset and then I'm going to take him back down inside and power him off. All right? If I don't feel as comfortable with that, if I've got a tough guy on my nose and I don't feel that way, then I might have to inside set and maybe bring my outside foot with me if I've got to step down inside a little bit further than normal. The inside foot moving here, this is one of the few times that the inside foot would move first. But again, now the thing that you got to be aware of here is the fact that that inside step is a flat and lateral move. It's not a step up. It's only a matter of angles to understand that. If I got a guy on my inside right here and I step up to set inside of him, he's already got me inside. All right? In order for me to get to a position where I want to get to at least head gear up on this guy, I better slide flat and lateral and get myself back down inside as quick as I can. So I can get back to that outside foot crotch position as soon as I possibly can within the contact concept. And we're working from the idea here of setting and making our feet move according to where this guy is. Inside set, your inside foot's going to move, you're going to get back to at least head gear up. Outside set, 
you're going to pick your foot up and set it down in place, outside foot to crotch. If the guy is wider than that and you've got to move your inside foot because your kick takes you there, then fine, it has to take you there. And the guy is head up on you, now the choice is yours, whatever you feel comfortable with. If you feel you can pick it up and set it back down in place, that's fine. All right? If you don't, if you feel you've got to set inside to protect yourself and set inside, or be ready to reset and come back out with the idea if the guy comes outside, or if he goes back down to the inside, then you're going to have to replace with your outside foot and drive him back down and flatten him out. As a pass protector, the guy can go one of two ways on you, all right? He can either go inside of you or outside of you. Very few guys go right directly over top of you. If they do, then that's easy, all right? If the guy goes outside of you, you always want to stretch the guy. Stretch the guy away from the point of contact, all right? You know where the quarterback is. You always want to keep your butt to the quarterback. Again, back to basketball, all right? Keep myself between the man and the, and the, and the, and the uh in the bucket, right? Same thing here, and I want to keep myself between the man and the quarterback. When we first started teaching this stuff, we used to say, keep your camera on the quarterback. What's your camera? Here's your camera right here. That's your brownie, right? That's on the quarterback at all times. That's how we started this stuff, right? But the idea here is getting yourself in between the quarterback and the defender. <coughs> so if the guy goes to the outside of me on the right side, then I'm going to stretch this guy, all right? I'm going to stretch it this way. All right? If he comes inside of me, then I'm going to power step him. I'm going to power step him down the line and flatten him out to the inside, not allowing him to get across my inside foot and allowing him to get penetration back to the inside. Again, maintaining target and focus all the time, constantly maintaining those types of situations. If the guy comes directly over top of your head, all right, then you're going to work on the idea where you're going to set bull this guy. All right? We always talk about an elevator all the time. If the guy's trying to bull me, I gotta get my hands back inside and elevate. I gotta work off my back foot. That's the reason your feet are staggered. Your feet are staggered because if the guy tries to bull you, you can work off your back foot. If he tries to pull you, you work off your front foot. Okay, so you stress yourself that way. The big thing about the stab concept, the big thing about the stab concept is an action reaction. Okay? It's a set, a stab, and a sit, right? And it's a stab and a sit together. It's action and reaction. Along with these drills that we're doing here, right? Ones that we do are what we call tie-up drills, right? We'll call tie-up drills when we get tied up with the guy. We're already in contact with him, okay? What we do is walk up, the guy walks up and grabs the guy behind the head. All right? I'm in this position, I'm the offensive guy, he's got me, he's standing here, he's got his hands around behind my head like this. I'm here like this. He's going to walk me back, all right? Just walking me back, all right? He pulls on me, oh, I press and I sit. Both hands, press and I sit. He pulls on the back of my head, I press and I sit. Action, reaction. Maintaining hand position, all right? And do this three times. Again, you don't want to come forward, all right? You don't want to work off your heels this way. You want to maintain your feet in the ground. Try to keep your whole foot on the ground. And again, balance where your shoelaces start. So when this guy pulls you, you sit down and you press back. All right? And you get your head gear away. Next one we'll do is what I call a twist and turn. They grab your shoulders. Grab them on the outside, right in the shirt, right in the shirt pouch. Right? And they'll walk you back again. And he pulls it and I press. All right? He pulls and press. All right? This way. Try to maintain again position, both feet in the ground. Not leaning forward on my toes. I'm not becoming a top-heavy player. I'm constantly dealing with the idea of trying to maintain the balance between my feet. All the time between my feet. But we're dealing with the idea here where we're trying to maintain the position. And again, that goes back to the beginning of what I was talking about before. Trying to maintain the position. And not losing that position. Making that the important part of what you're trying to accomplish from a drill standpoint. That's what you're trying to get at. Right? Now the third part of that situation, where they're in that tie-up, is what I call a punch drill. Right? Where they set at the line, punch at the line, drop away. Again, this is a little bit misleading, but it's not what we normally do. We don't punch and recoil, but we're going to punch and get away from the guy to create the separation again. All right? And then we do three of these, punches, punch and sit, punch and sit, all right? Here's a, here's a theory here, all right? 
and I'm coming back like this, when I punch, punch and sit, I want to keep my feet up underneath my body. All right? I don't want to turn my foot out this way. Most, a lot of guys, they, they feel more comfortable when they turn their foot and punch this way. Okay? I'm weak on this side. If I can keep it up here like this now, I punch and sit. Now he works this way. I don't know, like, I work back this way. I work back this way. So I've got my feet up underneath my body, where I don't have my foot outside my body. So try it again. Maintain that kind of a situation where your feet are pointed straight ahead. Again, it's just one thing more that they've got to be responsible for, but it's the idea where you're trying to put them in the right position. And you're trying to get them to do things right from a technical standpoint. Again, being fundamental. Concentrating on the small things. All the time dealing with that kind of situation. But you're all the time working along those lines. All right? Another kind of a situation. The drill setup will be again with the balls. All right? Having the guy align head up on me. So I set and stab. All right? Outside set, put him on the outside. Outside set, stab. Inside set, inside set, stab. All right? Where you're working, your footwork together, now you're incorporating your hand use. And again, still trying to maintain the knee bent position. All right? We'll work on a slide situation with the balls. All right? Same type of deal. Again, you got three of them. The kids lined up here, the guys with the balls are right here. Right? If this guy's a right side player, he's going to kick down this way. This guy throws him the ball, he punches. This guy stops, throws him the ball, he punches. This guy stops, throws him the ball, he punches. All right? I'm sorry. All right, but they're on the line. They're kicking this way. Okay, I'm on the right side. I'm kicking this way. Punch. All right? Do it. Punch. This way. All right? Punch. Okay? Three balls. So they get three punches. They get three kicks. And working on the outside, trying to maintain again the angle, the position, the procedures that you're dealing with from the standpoint of always keeping your elbows in, your hands up, and your butt down. All right? If I'm a left side player, if I'm a left side player, then I'll line here, and now I'll punch down the line that way. I'll punch down the line. I'll work down the line. If I'm a left side player, again, three bags this way. If I'm a right side guy, I'm going this way. I mean, three balls. All right? If I'm a left side player, I'm here. Punch, 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 okay? It's just like you're dealing with the old sled drill, but now you got something that's a moving target that can actually stab it properly. I've always found with that sled, they have a tendency to get too close to it where they lean forward or too far away from it where they're reaching for it. Now that ball comes to them, just like a defender does. So you're dealing with the idea here where the, where the punch is there. So you're working right side or left side. The center, hey, he can work either one. If he wants to work from a post foot, set foot, then he can go then he can go power step down the line like he's a left side player, or he can go kick slide like he's a right side player. Again, dealing with the fundamental aspects here. Constantly dealing with that kind of a situation there. Alright? One of the other things that we'll do, we'll line up the centers in the middle, okay? Right side players on the right side, left side players on the left side. Have, them every, have everybody line up in an outside position on your, on your offensive guy. Every defensive guy lines up in an outside position, all right? Now we'll go set, stab, and hold. Okay, so it's outside set, set, stab, hold. Okay, get your head back. Just hold that position. So you're concentrating again on a fundamental aspect. Put them on the inside position. Inside, set, stab, hold. All right? And again, the center's working on whatever he wants to work on because the center's in the middle. If he wants to create himself as a two-way guy, then he can always be working on an outside set. If he wants to develop a post-foot, set-foot philosophy, then he's got to develop himself as a right or left-side player. All those types of situations. Add to that, set, stab, and react. Okay? Now, you're going to, have, you're going to be in control of the situation as a coach because you're going to tell the guys on one side to go this way, the guys on this side to go that way. Okay? Or you're going to have inside on one side, outside on the other where you might have half of your group working on a kick slide concept on a stretch, and you got your other half of your group working on an inside maneuver to the inside on a power step. And then you flip it over. So it's set, stab, and hold, and set, stab, and react. Another thing that we'll do is what we call set bull or set snatch. 
right? I'll stand over there behind them. I'll say, okay, fine, man, we're going to do this. This is, this is what we're going to do right here, okay? And it's on second sound. The guy who was back to me doesn't know what to expect. This means bull. We're going to pull into that guy, so he's got to sit himself down, elevate, all right, work off his back foot, all right? The other one that we'll do along with this is right here. That's called a snatch, where you try to pull the guy forward. So he's right here, he's kept, now he's working off his front foot, sitting himself down that way, trying to work himself that way. It's very similar to what Keith was doing on that push-pull drill, okay? Very similar to that kind of a concept. With your feet, where you're balancing, your, where you're putting your balance between your feet and you're working off your front foot or your back foot. And those types of deals. But as far as pass protection drills are concerned, then you know what the situations are. You know what you can dream up as far as that kind of a concept is concerned. Hell, I remember one time I went up to the Bengals camp and Jimmy was coaching up there and he had a bunch of rookies there. He must have done like two hours of drills that I'd never seen before, okay? And I asked him after practice, I said, Jim, where, where the hell did you get those drills? I said, I don't know, I was just thinking up as I went along, all right? And, and, you know, that's the way drills are. If you know what your guys need work on or you know what their situations, what their shortcomings are, then you're constantly striving and stressing in those areas to make those guys better players. You have a problem with twists, all right? You have a problem with twists. I always like to do this with twists, okay? If I'm not working on a specific twist, all right, I'll line up five guys on five guys. Okay? And then I'll twist four of them and make the other guy be a rusher. Or I'll twist the two outside guys and make the middle guy be a drop. And now they're working together. The right tackle's working with the right guard. All right? The right guard is sometimes working with the center. The center is sometimes working with the right guard or the left guard. The left tackle is working with the left guard. And they're working together. And they're developing concepts about how they're going to handle these situations. Now, again, it doesn't normally happen, but it's just a philosophy of the idea of working the concept. Knowing that in, that in twist situations, you want to keep your shoulders square. You don't want to create different levels, right? You want to be able to work together, keep your head gear out of it, so you can push people by one way or the other. And it gets a real fast situation. You go bing, bang, boom, bing, bang, boom, bing, bang, boom, you're done in like five minutes. You can do 10 guys in five minutes, no problem. It's easy. Now, if they've got a specific twist that you know is going to give you trouble, then you take time during another period of practice or a time frame that you have, whether it be a meeting or whether it be a situation out on the field, where you can work on that specific twist. Make yourself time in those types of situations. That twist drill is something that, you know, that I feel is, 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 is basically a good situation because they're all working together. They're talking, they're communicating, and, and anybody who's standing around and watching it, I mean, they don't want to be embarrassed by getting beat by a twist by one of their buddies. And again, their buddies are trying to dip them by moving like this or trying to give that shit. And again, it becomes a situation where they're concentrating and they're working as hard as they can to develop those types of procedures. Fundamentals are important. Run, pass, whatever the situation is. Develop the fundamental concepts, work on those fundamental areas, and press those fundamentals constantly. Okay? Get the lights, please. Somebody. Okay, here's the drills with, with the balls now. Hitting with the heels of the hands. Elbows in. I'm stressing the idea of the head gear back, the butt down. No hip involvement here. It's all arms. It's punch and drop. Punch and drop. Again, the idea don't patty cake it, now punch it. Punch the ball. Same type of situation again. Punch the ball, sit it down, too high. Make the pass proper. Keep the butt down. It's just a situation where you're trying to work on that. Okay, now here's here's 
outside sets and inside sets and stabs. Now we're developing some movement philosophies now. Okay? The idea where the set, proper footwork, elbows in, head back, butt down. Those elbows in. Inside, outside set first. Again, footwork. The idea of punching and sitting. Okay, now here's inside set now. The inside. Again, working on the flat and the ladder. Deal with the idea of punching and sitting. Getting your head to your back. Sitting your butt down. Fundamentals, man, that's the key to the game, all right? That's the key to your success as a football team. That's the key to your success as a coach. Developing the fundamental procedures in your players. Constantly striving to make them as good as they can be. Again, the big thing that your job is is to try to make them self-actualize. Try to make them become the craftsmen that they are capable of becoming. Then I want to thank you for your time and your, and your attention.